Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. I appreciate you joining me here today. On the bench is a really cool old Gruen Precision, either from the late 60s or early 70s. I'm not entirely sure. I found it somewhat difficult to, to date this watch. This one here is going to be the next one in the line of our budget vintage rebuild series. And I bought this watch off eBay for a whole sum of $20 before shipping. The seller who sold it, uh, th there was no pictures of the inside of the watch or anything. The seller who sold it said it had a broken mainspring and was a non-runner. But for $20, I figured, what the heck, you know, if it actually is a broken mainspring, that's an easy enough fix. But here, when we start out here, I'm just checking the function of the watch. Uh, I'm looking at the rollover of the date, and the rollover seemed fine, but I'm seeing if there's a quick set. And I'm only feeling one position, one position in the crown to pull out. So it doesn't look like the date can be set independently. Um, this one here does have a feature that will allow you to, it has a semi quick set where you can roll it backwards and like you saw there and then reset it again. So not a true quick set, but it's at least better than winding it 24 hours at a time. This one all here also has a really cool faceted crystal. Um, the facets are actually on the underside of the crystal. So it, uh, it, you know, it's kind of unique that way, but I, I really like it. It's a cool looking crystal, really unique watch. This one here is a stainless case back, but a plated case, and uh, it it needs really clean. And, I, and you know, you can only you can't really polish these too much without going through the plating. And I'm not sure how well it came through in the video, but there is tiny little pieces, uh, kind of right on the corners where the plating is kind of starting to rub, wear away. But uh, it was not bad at all. But if you clicked on this video because of the thumbnail, here's where we're going to see why and. This is what the eBay seller calls a broken mainspring. Um, well, that's not a mainspring. That is the hairspring on the balance. And uh, this thing here is just mangled. Uh, it was kind of wrapped around that oscillating weight. And uh, I've, I've never come across one like that. But as you can see, this watch is certainly a non-runner. Um, so right away, you know, I knew that's obviously not repairable, uh, not even by the best of us, that hairspring cannot be repaired. So uh, we'll have to source a, a new balance complete at least for this. But uh, I'm, I'm just kind of at this point here, when I first got this watch in, I took the back off of it and I saw that hairspring and I immediately just closed it back up. I said, you know what? I'm just going to wait. I'm not going to dig any further because what a video you know, that would make, look at that hairspring. So yeah, this thing here was um, quite something. So the first thing we're gonna do here is just remove this balance and uh, get it out of the way. And we do that by removing the one screw holding down the balance. And even with the movement in the case, we can still remove this balance here. And uh, with it out of the way, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of sitting here staring at this thing as I was pulling this out and there was probably 10 minutes of footage that I had to, I cut down into just this tiny short little clip just because I'm kept staring at this thing, trying to figure out how this happened from what used to be a working balance. But uh, with that balance out of the way, we can start off by removing the oscillating weight. This one here is held down by this one screw, it holds down kind of a flat piece of, piece of metal and that metal slides in on the underside of the oscillating weight and above the pinion that's attached to it and just kind of keeps keeps it held down in place. And then these, especially on you know ones that are dirty, these are supposed to lift straight up and because uh, it engages with a gear in the automatic works and you don't want to pull these off really at an angle. Sometimes they can be a little bit stuck on. So just very gently try to lift it straight up just like you saw there. And uh, then that thing can come apart and you can see that gear and that's permanently affixed to the underside of that, that oscillating weight. So then we can remove the automatic works and just get that out of the way. And I know all my previous videos have been Seiko's and, um, you know, they, they show one variation or another, most of them, uh, I think probably if not all of them that I've up, that I've uploaded have been part of the, have that magic lever system, a really simple way of having a bi-directional, uh, winding system for the automatic works. This one here is a super complicated unidirectional and uh, only works in one direction. And uh, we'll get this thing taken apart here. We got these four screws removed. And I wanted to, I'm gonna pop up a little window here on the bottom left of your screen and just so you can, so you can see, 
one of those screws is significantly longer than the others. So kind of when you're taking screws out of your watches, you know, always it, it's good practice to look for things like that because you definitely don't want to put that long screw in the wrong slot because it can interfere with something um, that it shouldn't be otherwise. So taking apart this automatic uh, winding works here, the first thing we're going to do is pull out this plate and that is the plate that has the stud that the, um, that the oscillating weight attaches to. Uh, it's kind of a semi friction fit. Um, but with that out of the way, the next thing we do is remove more screws on this thing. There's a total of nine screws just in this little automatic works. I mean, it's, it's really kind of complicated just for what it is. And I, I've seen this system in a lot of the, uh, AS, uh, movements. The, uh, this one here is the movement is labeled I N I N T 7522 dash three. Uh, you probably saw in the oscillating weight, it said Duromat, um, in my research, the uh, Duro, I think it was D-U-R-O-W-E, is the company that makes this movement. Um, and here I'm, I kind of, when I separated those two parts out, I, I, I wanted to reassemble it real quick and just kind of get it on video just to make sure I have something to reference back to if I need to. But uh, as you can see, there's a lot of parts here and a couple springs and a lot of things that are, you know, really difficult to keep in place before you put those two plates together. But uh, here uh, we're just pulling the rest of the components out, giving them an inspection. That wheel doesn't look all that great. It's just dirty. Uh, that is the transmission wheel. That wheel connects to two other gears that are work as intermediate gears between that and the crown wheel to uh, kind of connect this automatic works to the, the, the base components of the movement. But with that last plate, with that base plate there, that is the automatic works for this movement. And the next thing we want to do is remove any power in this watch. Um, this thing here was super dirty, so that took quite a while. That's why I chopped that down. But we have two gears here uh, that connect the automatic works. So that, that was the first one there. Uh, that thing there could just pull straight out, and I just want to get that out of the way before we pull this movement out because there's really nothing to hold it down otherwise unless if that automatic works bridge is not on there. So we removed the movement ring, as you see, uh, that one there was a, it's a really tight fit, but, uh, it also kind of has these, those spring bars kind of integrated into it that, uh, put tension between that movement ring and the case back. Next up, we remove the crown and now we can pull this movement out of the watch. Uh, there's nothing left to hold it down. So we, once we do that, we flip it over, put it on a casing cushion here and just lift it straight up. And when we pull this off here, you can take a look at that dial. And this is kind of typical from, you know, you can see those marks on the dial and in, in the shape of that crystal. And uh, it's kind of common. I've seen that on a, on a lot of watches of this kind of shape that I've taken apart here. So next up, we're removing the hands. Uh, just put a piece of plastic down between the hands and your tools just to make sure we don't scratch anything up. But um, those come apart quite easily. Pretty standard. Nothing special right there. Next step is to remove the dial. And in order to do that, there's two K screws that need to be loosened or not K screws, but two dial feet screws that need to be loosened. And once that's done, we can separate the dial like you see right here. And here I'm removing that other gear, the, the secondary uh, intermediate gear between the automatic works and the crown wheel. Because when I put this thing on a movement holder, I don't, just don't want the thing to fall out and get lost. So that was the second gear I was referring to. Next up here, we are removing, starting with the dial side disassembly. We remove the hour wheel. And next up, uh, I'm removing the uh, the cover plate for the um, day wheel or date wheel indexing arm and spring. And there's a spring underneath that. So I'm kind of keeping tension down on that wheel. I just don't want that spring to come flying off when I pull this plate off. There's not much you can do about it if it decides it wants to, but you just kind of do it very gently. And then you can see that spring and... Uh, setting lever right there that indexes that wheel into the proper position. So the next thing I do here is uh, I'm going to just use some Rodico and uh, then use my little hold down tool and hold down that spring and just remove that wheel. And then the next thing we do is we just, while holding the spring down, release tension on it and then we can remove that spring. The next thing is there is a cover plate on this here that covers the keyless works and the calendar works and all that. And it's held down by three screws. 
we can just pull those out quite simply and get this removed. This one here, the calendar works is kind of unique. This is the first time I had run across one that was like this. And so i uh, kind of interested to, I mean, I mean it's, it's different than what I've been able to post before. So it's, it's kind of neat. So we'll get into that. Uh, once that plate's out of the way, that plate also covers the teeth on that, on that date wheel. So you have to have that plate removed, but once that's out of the way, we can remove that. This is a tension spring for this, that this arm that it attaches to is, I mean, I don't even know what it's called actually, but what it does, and it kind of popped off there, is that is what advances the the date wheel around as, uh, as that kind of light bluish piece on top of the calendar wheel advances forward. It, 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 the, the plane on that wheel increases and eventually when it hits that, cliff on the end of that wheel and goes down, it pops that spring in back in towards the day wheel. And just by the way, the tip of it shaped when it engages with it, it advances at one position. So but with that out of the way, this is an intermediate wheel that goes between the uh, calendar driving wheel and the hour wheel. And that's what connects the calendar works to the motion works. We can get that out of the way. Then we remove the ham the uh, minute wheel. And this is an intermediate wheel between the keyless works and the minute wheel. And here I do a close up. I'd mentioned this in other videos, but there's a really good shot of it in this video. I wanted you to see where, see how the left side of that gear kind of has a radius cut to the teeth and the, the right side is 90 degrees. When you see them that way, you always want to make sure when you install those, that that radius cut goes downwards on that pivot where uh, that's the side that the uh, sliding clutch engages with. So next up, we remove the cannon pinion with our cannon pinion removal tool. And you can see a really good view of the cannon pinion for this watch. And that is the single part that transfers all the power and energy from the rear side of the movement to the front side of the movement. Next up, we can remove what's left of the calendar works by removing this one screw. And that's that kind of odd shaped, you know, I want to call it gear, but just a part that engages with that spring that advances that date wheel. Uh, but we get that out of the way. And then the calendar driving wheel can come off here. And I'm just using a bit of Rodico to remove it. And uh, here, that that wheel has two different sides to it. And uh, so just kind of taking a mental note of that so that I can put it back in in the correct order. Next up is to remove the setting lever spring. In order to do that, we want to remove tension. So I just loosen the screw first and then remove tension off the setting lever. And then we can safely remove the spring by without you know any fear of it flying off into oblivion. But... Once that's out of the way, we can uh, just use a bit of Rodico here just to hold down the yoke spring when we remove tension on it. And uh, that can come out of the way. It, uh, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward on the keyless works on this thing as compared to other watches. Next up here, we're going to remove the yoke. That yoke, the tip of it kind of slides into a, a, a hole cut into the side of the, the main plate there. So it, you have to put in one side before you put in the other. Then we remove the winding pinion and now we just remove the clutch wheel. In order to remove the setting lever on this one, uh, that one's not held in like a, on a post or anything like the, the previous Seiko videos. There's a setting, there's a setting lever screw that goes through the movement. So you got to loosen that screw from the rear side of the watch here. Uh, that's why you see me flipping it over and we can just un unscrew that screw and that setting lever will just fall off when it completely unthreads. But with that out of the way, the dial sides, completely disassembled and we can start off by disassembling the rear side of the watch, starting with this reverse headed re reverse thread screw on the crown wheel. Um, most of the time that'll be identified where you saw there was three slots cut into that screw head. And that's an identifier that it's a reverse threaded screw. They won't always be that way. Um, but general rule is you could pretty much always anticipate that crown wheel being that way. Um, they aren't always, but even, so you'll, you'll find a lot of those that don't have that three slotted screw, but they still will be reverse thread. But with those out of the way, we can remove the ratchet wheel screw and pop off the ratchet wheel itself. Just taking a look at the underside of that part, just to make sure everything looks good. And then the click spring, and that's a kind of really unique click spring, but it's kind of an interesting design. And I like the way they engineered it because I mean, it doesn't, it's not held in under tension when you first put it in. So that's, that's kind of unique. So here we're checking the, the side shake on the, on the barrel. And, uh, 
for the main plate on the barrel arbor for the main plate. And that's a bit more than you want to see. Uh, that will cause the watch to, you know, it, it won't transfer power as efficiently as it could because that barrel's wobbling inside that, uh, inside that bridge. So we, we're going to, we're going to repair that, but uh, we'll remove this barrel bridge. Uh, this is held on by two screws. Uh, I double check these just to make sure that those screws are the same length because some, sometimes they won't be. And since we've already ran into that once on this watch, it's, it's definitely worth checking. But here we're just uh, using a, just a small screwdriver to, you know, release just to get that thing started. And uh, then we can remove the barrel bridge. After that's out of the way, next up we can remove the barrel itself and we'll disassemble that barrel here shortly in the video. The next thing to come off is gonna be the trend wheel bridge. And this particular one is held on by two screws. This one here has uh, three pivots in it that uh, we're gonna to have to realign for the, uh, the fifth wheel, the third wheel and the escape wheel. But uh, once we get those screws out of the way, we can just, this one here just can't, came off pretty simply. It wasn't held on there too hard. And then uh, now we can start removing the trainer wheels themselves. We'll start off by the fifth wheel. That's what the, uh, the seconds hand actually connects to. After that is the third wheel on this watch. And uh, even though this isn't, you know, a 63 series Seiko third wheel, you know, it still gives me pause. If you watched any of my previous videos, you'd, You'd know the backstory to that. But um, after that, the escape wheel comes out and I'm just double checking the, the pivots on that. After that's done, then we can remove the pallet fork. And in or order to do that, we have to remove the pallet fork bridge, which is held on by this one screw. That one there was kind of, you know, it was kind of sandwiched on there pretty good. It, it, uh, it took a little bit of uh, gentle persuasion with the tweezers to remove it, but uh, you definitely don't want to attack it too hard because I mean, it, it is still the pivot for the, uh, for the pallet fork is, is still sitting in there. So you always just want to be careful with that. And we can now remove the center wheel bridge that is held on by one screw. And, um, if I can use my tweezers properly, but, uh, we just use a little bit of, you know, Again, just gentle persuasion here to kind of get that the the kind of the static hold on that plate broken, and then uh, just use a bit of Rodico to remove it, and then we can just pull out this this center wheel here. After that, uh, one thing I didn't show actually was the the setting lever screw uh, on that. I apparently I missed it clearly uh, when editing the video, but that was the last piece. I just pulled that screw out uh, that that we unscrewed earlier that holds down the uh, the setting lever. But here I'm just removing the mainspring and, and uh, this is one of the few times in this video where I forgot to hit record on the microscope camera. So my apologies, but uh, I'm sure this is probably not your first time ever watching watching a rebuild video. So you, you, I'm sure you've probably seen a mainspring get unwound before, but uh, that's what I'm doing here. And my plan was to use the footage from the microscope because clearly my hands are in the way with the, the desktop camera, but, um, but that thing came out. So next I just start doing a little pre-cleaning. So after cleaning is completed, uh, I mount the balance to the main plate here, and we're gonna go ahead and clean and lubricate the balance jewels. So um, again, this is another part here later in this process. I don't know what I was thinking, but I forgot to hit record on the microscope. So you get to see me reattach the spring uh, just with the desktop camera, which doesn't give you a whole lot of detail, but uh, it's basically the reverse order. What we just had a really good shot there of it going in on. So uh, I'm pulling out. Uh, use a bit of Rodico to uh, remove that and then the dumping it into a uh, deal of uh, one dip. 
But after that gets a good soak, I put the jewel um, flat side down on a, just a, that's just a post-it note, uh, like a, like a sticky note. And then uh, I use this kind of just padded sanding stick and I just kind of buff that jewel to get, try to get most of the, uh, the gunk off of the face of it. And this one here is kind of an interesting deal. Like most of them that you come across on these jewels, the, you know, they have a flat side and a dome side. And then this one, what they consider a flat side, the side of it is flat, but as you can see right on the edges, it's kind of rounded. So it took me a bit because I kept thinking that was the dome side of the, the jewel, but the other side has a more pronounced curve. And on that side, the curve is only right on the edges where the center part is flat. So it, it, it took me, you know, it, I had to, you know, make sure that I was assembling it in the right order at first, because usually most of the time they are just perfectly flat all the way across. But once we get it uh, reassembled, I oil it with automatic oiler in here. Um, again, no microscope footage, unfortunately. But um, I uh, set that jewel in place, and then we'll just use a bit of Rodico here to uh, hold that spring. And I that's how I transferred over, because I, I have found, me personally, that I just, you know, it's, it's easy to have one of those springs kind of fly off your tweezers. So I, I just use Rodico, and then... A little two tweezer method method I, I find to be kind of safe on this one here um i just you set the back end of it in first into a recess and then you can you know put both of those arms on each side of the spring and kind of set those into place but uh, i really like this spring it's a very simple design and um it works great but that exact same process was duplicated on the underside of the movement with the bottom side balance tool and here i'm inspecting the alignment, um, the top arrow, it shows the impulse jewel. The, the bottom two arrows are up for the pallet wheel and escape wheel, pallet fork and the escape wheel. And with the balance at a rest, you want that impulse jewel to be in line with those other ones. And um, it's sitting in the middle of the banking pins, which in this particular movement are machined into the main plate. And if that thing is sitting dead center uh, at rest, that means your, your, your beat arrow is going to be very marginal when you do get that watch put back together, but it's kind of an indicator that the, everything's kind of lined up where it should be. So next up here, we're going to lubricate the side walls of this barrel. Um, I'm, I'm using um, uh, 8217 for that. Here, uh, this particular barrel's got recesses cut into the sidewall, six of them. And since this mainspring winds to the right, what I've done is put a dab of that braking grease to the right side of those recesses. So that way when the mainspring grabs it, it, it spreads it out across the face of that barrel wall and doesn't just, it doesn't, that, that lubric, that grease doesn't puddle up inside those recesses. Um, but with that done, uh, here I'm, we're reusing the old, the existing mainspring and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just setting it in the winder here and I'm just trying my best to give you a close up shot of me setting that hook on the, uh, on the Arbor, uh, right there at kind of really difficult to film. But, uh, next we're just going to use the automatic winder here or the mainspring winder here to do that. And this spring here is kind of unique because usually on those automatic ones, there's a bridle at the tip of it. And as you can see there, it's just nothing. I thought it was, you know, maybe the bridle had broken off or something. So what I did is, uh, you know, when we had that damaged balance, I sourced a, a donor movement. And I actually pulled that mainspring apart, the barrel apart on that donor movement and double checked that spring also. And it was identical. So um, very rarely, I mean, I can't remember the last time I ran across an automatic mainspring that did not have some sort of a bridle end on it. But apparently in my research on this, that is just the way these things came. So I went with it and, you know, it everything's working. So, you know, it's, it's clearly doing its job. I just, you know, found that interesting. So here, after it gets wound, I'm, the, the challenge on these mainspring winders is to remove that that winding arbor without the spring coming out with it. So I started off with a kind of a, an X-Acto knife, and then uh, once I have the room, I use my tweezers to pull the rest, pull it the rest of the way out, and then uh, we set it into the uh, the barrel. This here is Mobius eighty two hundred. Um, you can lubricate these mainsprings before you put it in the winder. Here, I've just always liked doing it this way. Um, and, uh, I just put three little dabs of it and you can see it kind of immediately drop down into that spring. And, uh, that, that 
lubrication will work its way around and um, kind of get where it needs to go. Next up here, we got to put in the uh, the arbor. So what I like to do is kind of have my arbor, once I lubricate the uh, inner wall or inside lip there for that, that's more, that's HP 1300. I line up the the, uh, the, the eyelet on the uh, spring and the hook on the arbor. So then when I use my tweezers here, I just kind of tilt it in place and engage those pieces first and then rotate that arbor in. That one went in beautifully. Uh, they don't always go in that nice, but that's my preferred method of doing it. Um, and then here, I'm just using a bit more HP 1300 to uh, put some lubrication on the shoulder of that uh, barrel uh, arbor. And that's where the, uh, the case lid is going to kind of engage with that. So you want to make sure that's lubricated. And next we just need to put the lid, the cap on the, uh, on the barrel arbor. So this little tool here, a uh, cheap little tool, but it's great. You put that on and then you put the lid on. And then that, the, on that clear cap, it's a, uh, it's kind of a flush cut on the underside of that. So it puts even, when you press down on it, it puts even pressure on the barrel lid uh, on all the way around. So uh, once you do that and that one there, you, know, you sometimes you'll hear them click into place, but I'm just double checking that just to make sure that that lid is perfectly flush and seated all the way down. But with that out of the way, we begin assembly of the actual movement and we start off by doing the center wheel. And so we lubricate both sides of the center wheel, as you just see here, uh, that is going to be HP 1300. Next up, we install the center wheel bridge. Just making sure that that kind of gets set into place. You saw it kind of, once it found its home, it just dropped straight down and the one center wheel bridge screw. One thing I really like to do on all the movements, even though I didn't adjust this, you know, I, I check in shake, even though I didn't, you know, adjust anything on this before, I just want to double check it because this is final assembly. And to my eye, that looks perfect. Um, so you just want a little bit of movement in there. Not a lot, but um, and there we go. Now we're putting in that, um, that uh, setting lever screw that I forgot to show earlier, but uh, lubricating the bottom uh, barrel arbor port with uh, HP 1300 and we'll get that set into place. Just kind of, there you go. Now you saw it kind of sit down there. The next thing we want to do is fix that barrel arbor or, or the barrel bridge. And, uh, there we go. Yeah. So, um, what we do is I have a domed punch, a domed stump or anvil on the bottom and a dome punch. And what that's going to do is kind of squeeze that hole on the barrel arbor in tighter. And what we're, and it just takes little light taps on the hammer and you want to kind of hit it a couple times very lightly and then rotate it around and repeat that process. I do it five or six times here, very light taps, but uh, what we'll do here and you can kind of see the camera kind of vibrate a little bit, but as I'm, as I'm hitting it and then what, I'll hit it and you can kind of see it go there and then I'll, I'll turn it and tap it again and work your way around a few times. And what we're trying to do is close that hole to close it tighter than what it should be, where it actually won't, mount uh where that it's too tight for the uh for the barrel arbor to fit in and you know once we get that done here i'll we'll pull this off here and i'll show you that real quick we'll remount this this bridge and you can see that it's it's sitting high on that uh on that barrel arbor where it won't slide all the way down so you can see kind of right there and what you want to do is the reason we close this down tighter than it needs to be is then we then we begin by very slowly opening that hole back up with a smoothing brooch and that smoothing brooch is going to open up that hole, but it's also just going to kind of harden that steel and almost burnish it really. Um, but you go very slowly on that. And, uh, if you go too far, you have to basically start over. But, um, I, 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 it was two or three times of me slightly, uh, doing that and then opening that hole back up before I got the fit that I like, but you saw there, we, once it got into place, I, I recleaned that part just to make sure everything was good. And then, uh, and we reinstalled the bridge for the final time, uh, reattaching those two screws. And then after that's done, we'll just kind of sit there and yeah, do a final torque on them. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but we'll do a final torque on those. I also checked the, uh, end shake of that, uh, also, but since we did work on this, uh, I didn't pre-lubricate the, uh, 
that side of the barrel arbor. So uh, here I'm just using a bit of HP 1300 and you can see capillary action pull that oil down. And uh, then we're just gonna give this a, a quick test just to make sure everything's looking good. Um, side shake looked great, uh, in shake, even though it wasn't shown on camera, I did double check it and everything looked good there. So we can continue on. We start uh, off assembling the wheel train by installing the escape wheel on this particular movement. And you can see, watch this escape wheel just kind of fall right into place there, right, right there. I mean, that's obviously gonna come, it's not gonna stay in there but before we get to mounting the bridge, but uh, you'll see kind of how it, when it kind of aligns itself where it needs to go. But then we get the third wheel in and I'm just, you know, spinning that, uh, that, that center wheel just to make sure everything's engaging and then we're lubricating the fifth wheel, the part of the pivot on that fifth wheel with 90 10 and letting that kind of drop into place and then just kind of doing my best to line everything up and get everything straight because the next thing to go on is the bridge. And uh, so I'm trying to get all those pivots as close to, to lined up where they need to be as possible. And then uh, we can install a bridge. And this is always, you know, for me, for me that it, it, you know, it's always either really easy or sometimes you get some that are super difficult and super stubborn. Um, I do the tap trick on this one here. Uh, it's not just a Seiko thing, but uh, I do it on every watch I work on. This one here, everything went in except for that top port of the escape wheel. And uh, I'm just putting very, very light pressure down on that bridge and then just kind of adjusting that escape wheel. And then I, I go down and um, I'm, I'm using, it's off camera here, but I'm gonna turn that that barrel and uh then you can see the pivot kind of sets in place this is all one shot so this one here wasn't too terrible but um you keep pressure down again and pressure i'm using that term very lightly it's very very light pressure just enough to keep it from moving but i'm not forcing it down at all but uh, i'm going to get both of these screws started and um before i release pressure on that because i just don't want anything moving on me while uh, while we get this set in place because those pivots are not very long. It does not take much to move one out of the way. And then if you tighten that bridge down, that pivot absolutely will break or the jewel or both. But uh, once that's out of the way, uh, I, I test it one more time just to make sure everything's good to go. But um, everything, everything looked good there. So here we go. And uh, right now you don't see any kickback when the wheels stop. And that's because we don't have the click spring and um, you know the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel kind of set in place. So there, that's right now. There's nothing on that mainspring that's gonna kick those wheels back, like uh, like you've seen on a lot of these videos. So next up, we're gonna go ahead and lubricate the the uh, wheel train, and we lubricate the escape wheel and the fifth wheel with uh, ninety ten. This is the third wheel, and I'm lubricating that with HP thirteen hundred. Ninety ten is. Uh, it's a thinner lubrication uh, and uh, HP 1300, if you want to consider it kind of a medium grade, uh, you know, uh, parts that moving maybe a bit more slowly with a, under a bit more torque. And then uh, kind of the, the thick stuff is going to be the grease. But we're lubricating those same points on the underside. Um, the fifth wheel, we don't have to lubricate on the other side because that's where the second hand mounts. And uh, we pre-lubricated the center wheel. So the only two things on the dial side we need to lubricate are the escape wheel and the... Um, the third wheel but after all that is out of the way we can install our click spring and i really am a fan of that i mean it just sometimes you got to hold that spring in there and hold your tongue right and make sure it doesn't fly off on you but um here uh this one here just kind of it just sits flat i really like it so we put on the ratchet wheel and make sure that the um you know the square cut hole in that uh kind of aligns with that barrel arbor and then uh, once that screw gets down there, in order to kind of torque it down, you need to hold that ratchet wheel still. So I just use my hold down tool. The next thing is the crown wheel and uh, putting a little bit of HP 1300 there. And we then we install the bushing. And that bushing was a really, really tight fit. Uh, I'm kind of surprised me. So what I use here is kind of the my tweezers to kind of press that thing down and um, make sure that it's flush because you know, it, it was not a loose fit. It doesn't just drop right on. It's it's definitely machined to a specific tolerance. But then um, just a dab more HP 1300 on the outside of that bushing, and then we can install our crown wheel. On this one here, it took me a minute. It didn't want to sit down completely all the way, and the reason that is is because it was um, the, the click spring was kind of in the way. 
So what I do here is I just kind of pull that click spring out of the way just a tiny bit. And then that crown wheel sits all the way. And it wasn't much, but it, it allowed it to sit down just that tiniest amount that, that it had left. But with that in, you can see a, a very a, you know clear shot of those three slots cut into that, uh, that screw there. And whenever you see that on those, I mean, you immediately just reverse thread. So it, it, it's kind of a mental block you have to get over because, you know, for your entire life, you screw in screws to the right to tighten them, but not that one. But with the wheel train in, I'm just going around with my fine tip boiler and um, looking at inshake on these things, just kind of giving everything a once over just to make sure everything looks good. Um, it, it's somewhat difficult because the wheels will spin on you, but I mean, you, you can check it right there. Everything looked good. So now we are down to installing the pallet fork. And on there, we just uh, get that pallet fork set into place uh, very gently again, just to make sure that we don't break anything. But then we get the bridge on. And um, this one's got two post indexing posts that it sits in. And then uh, once you kind of get that thing down all the way, uh, again, very lightly, just kind of move that pallet fork around, make sure that uh, the pivots are in the jewels properly. And then we can uh, tighten it down with the, uh, the one pallet fork bridge screw. After that's done, we can apply some power to the watch. Uh, just put in a couple winds. You don't have to wind it up all the way, but just a couple winds. And then we can check and see, make sure that it's uh, the pallet forks engaging and disengaging properly. Uh, just kind of doing this test here. And you'll see that it kind of, you know, forcibly indexed to the next position. And that's, uh, that's telling you exactly what you need to know there. That's what, that's what you're looking for. So, uh, this is time number two where I forgot to hit record on the microscope, but you can see, that's why you always see me when I'm lubricating the, um, the escape wheel or the, uh, the pallet fork, uh, exit stone on my other videos, that video is shaking. And that's exactly why you see me holding it at a very odd angle. But um, I lubricate the exit stone, and then um, I do that three times around. There's 15 teeth on that wheel, so I'll lubricate that stone and uh, apply it to five teeth at a time. And next, we install the balance. This is the balance from the donor movement that cleaned up quite nice. Uh, it uh, Once we get that set in place, uh, it always helps to, you know, you try, try to get that bottom pivot in the jewel and then rotate it around to index into the pallet fork. And then it helps to keep your balance steady and you turn the movement and not the other way around. But that is honestly the best feeling for me in watchmaking and watch repair is to see that balance come alive for the first time after you've had this watch torn completely apart. And this one, especially, even though that is not the balance that you saw in the first part of the video, that is a one from a donor movement, exact same, exact same balance, but actually functioning. Uh, here, um, I'm looking at a few things. I'm looking at the roller table and the, uh, and the, uh, impulse jewel on the underside of that. And you can always gauge amplitude on there. And that's really healthy because you can see that impulse jewel rotating around, but that looks great. I'm looking at the flatness of the hairspring. And then I'm looking, also looking at the hairspring on the right side where it was indexing with the, with the regulating pins, just to make sure it's center and it's, um, hitting, you know, it's indexing both sides to both sides of those indexing pins is it? Uh, regulating pins as it moves back and forward. And lastly, I'm just kind of doing a final inspection here. Just taking a look, focus my microscope here, just taking a look at everything just to see if there's anything that stands out, uh, that is, is something either I missed or something doesn't look right. And, um, I'm watching these wheels go around, you know, I'm just doing the initial regulation. These are the results. I mean, it ran for 20 minutes just by me inspecting it. And I put it on the time graph or usually needs to run longer but I'm just doing an initial, an initial time setting. I speed up the video here. And the first thing you want to do is adjust your beat error, which we're at 1.3. And then you saw those lines kind of come together into one. And um, the closest you can get to zero is great. Um, 0.1 is, I mean, there's no reason to go from 0.1 to zero, but it'll, it'll kind of level itself out. But after you kind of get beat error set in, at least in this initial position, then you can work on the rate. And uh, they're very small adjustments on that. Um, Adjusting that rate takes the tiniest movement. You can move it massive amounts of seconds. But um, when you make a change, you need to kind of let it run and settle in. And again, this is not final regulation by any means. This is just getting the watch kind of keeping moderate, you know, somewhat time when you first get it set up. But this thing will run for several days and then we'll test it in multiple positions. And um, but this is just kind of the first go at it just to see what those numbers originally look like. And 
amplitude looks great and it's going to raise about another 20 to 25 degrees as the, as it settles in and you know, the lubrication gets to where it needs to go and the watch kind of finds its, finds its groove. So, um, that's great. I mean, this watch that those are really great numbers. So I'm really pleased with that. So we begin the assembly of the dial side of the movement with the setting lever. And in order to get, you know, put that setting lever in, you kind of need to hold it down here. And that's why you see me, I'm going to hold down that setting lever with my finger. And then from the underside of the watch, sorry for the fuzzy video. I just didn't have a you know, better option. Screwing that screw down from the underside, from the other side, and just to get that setting lever in place. Here I am applying some grease to the winding pinion for the keyless works. And then we're going to also apply some grease here to the that same mating surface on the clutch wheel that engages with that winding pinion. And that is a very, 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 you know, um, there's a lot of friction, a lot of force um, on that. Probably the most in the watch, uh, really, uh, where those two parts meet and interact with one another. So that takes uh, a good amount of um, of grease. And then uh, after that's done, I'm... I'm kind of put a blob of grease on the end of my boiler here, but I'm only using the very tip of it. Uh, and that's just how I like to do it. But I mean, it allows me to put the amount I want in the place that I want, but I'm putting it in that recess of that uh, for, for the yoke. And then I'm applying some 1300 here on the post where the yoke uh, will go. And then applying a bit more of that grease uh, to the, uh, the mating surface of the setting lever where it's going to interact with the yoke as well. The next up here on the left side, you see I have to get that left side of the yoke kind of set into that recess, and then uh, then it can go on its post there, and then uh, make sure that it's in that recess on the on the um, on the winding on the uh, sliding clutch. Next up is to install the yoke spring. Um, this one here, uh, yeah, I'm kind of moving that setting lever out of the way, and just to kind of see. I'm trying to get that yoke out in its furthest position that it'll go to. Um, to, before I set that spring in. And then I'm just applying the slightest amount of grease here on the edge of that yoke and on the edge of the, also on the edge of that plate where that, uh, that spring is going to sit. Just because, I mean, that is metal on metal contact. And uh, you can, you know, I, I just like to put very slight amounts of grease in that point. But when I did that, I popped the spring out of place. So uh, we'll <laughs> remount this spring. And then uh, sometimes th these can be kind of a pain, but you definitely, these are under a lot of tension. So you have to, you know, make sure you're, you're taking precautions uh, when you're when you're reattaching these here. But uh, I hold it down with my little hold down tool and uh, get the one side set in place just like that. And then just use my brass tweezers here and just kind of rotate it down. And uh, you can see it get where it kind of puts, where it sets up against that yoke there. And then I'm um, just kind of being very careful when I pull my tools off there just to make sure that everything's where it needs to go. The next thing to go on is going to be the setting lever spring. And uh, I go ahead and apply some grease into that spring, into the two indexing ports where it's going to set in with the setting lever and then get that kind of set into place. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to set it in into the setting lever just yet. I'm going to get the screw in and started. Uh, and then uh, once that screw's not fully tightened down, just loose, uh, just kind of, yeah, here we go. Just, no, not even torqued, but then we can go in there and then put tension on that spring by setting it into the uh, correct spot on the indexing lever. As you see right here, kind of get that on there and then kind of fold my tool over to kind of get it set down there where, where it needs to go. Just like that. And then once that's done, then we can apply, uh, tighten that down that screw fully. Once that's done, now we need to install the uh, the uh, stem and crown. And so I'm just loosening, not removing, but just loosening that setting lever screw. That will allow me to uh, put in the put in the stem. But first, we need to go ahead and lubricate it. So I'm applying grease to that uh, on these flats here, where it goes into that uh, sliding clutch here. Just put a little dab of grease on each of those four sides of the sliding clutch. Uh, you put it on the tip here. I didn't have really have enough lubrication on there. So I'm kind of reapplying here uh, a little bit on the tip and then a little bit up top in that recess where the setting lever engages with that and uh, where it holds into place. But once we have that done, we can go ahead and install the stem 
it just kind of slides right in. You may need to rotate it a little bit where the flats align with the um, the flats cut into the the inside of the uh, the sliding clutch. But uh, we get the screw tightened down, and then we can kind of give it a test and just make sure that you know it's all working like it should. And this part here is a very tactile thing when you're when you're working on a watch. Uh, you kind of know if you don't have like if you don't have grease uh, lubrication already in your setting lever spring, it's going to be very difficult to um, to adjust the position of the stem and the crown. So, um, but once everything kind of tests out good, I clean it up with a bit of Rodico and we can move on. I'm applying more of that same grease uh, to the cannon pinion. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and lubricate kind of the rest of this here. I'm applying HP 1300 to the minute wheel post and the intermediate winding wheel posts. And then uh, also here on the intermediate calendar wheel and one more here, a little bit more HP 1300 for the calendar driving wheel. And then just a little dab here on this raceway where that, uh, where that wheel sits on the main plate. But uh, once that's done, we can install the cannon pinion that is friction fit. And usually, I mean, it's a very, you'll hear a kind of a click. And then uh, next we install the, Intermediate uh, winding gear. Uh, remember, radius cut down where, it, uh, and uh, if if you put it on the other way, you can spin it, and you'll feel it. It doesn't feel as smooth um, when it interacts. If if it does have the cut on there, you, you'll feel the difference uh, between one side or the other. But next up, we install the minute wheel, and uh, since we already have the cam pinion on there and the winding wheel on there, um, you just kind of pay close attention, and then you know I'm just making sure that the the teeth are interacting on both sides of that wheel and everything's sitting flush and then just give it a quick test. I'm applying a little bit of 90-10 to this intermediate counter wheel. Um, just, uh, again, I, I didn't really have, a, I had no manual on this. So I'm, I'm, I'm applying just kind of common practices on everything uh, here. The, there really is, if there is documentation on this movement, I couldn't find it. But um, once that's in place, we install the calendar driving wheel and just kind of make sure that, you know, it, it, everything's kind of engaging like it should. Next up here, uh, I don't know exactly what this part is called, but it, I'm guessing it is kind of the, 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 the date wheel spring driving cam, I guess. I, I'm sure there's a technical name for it, but I don't know what it is. But um, that's held on by one screw, so we'll get that uh, set in place here and just do a final torque on it. Um, you know, these screws, you know, they need to be tight, but you don't want to over torque them. They are tiny. It, you can break a screw head. So, you know, you kind of get the feel for it, you know, if it's kind of what feels right. But uh, I'm applying a little bit of lubrication there to that, uh, to that hole where this uh, date wheel, you know, advancing spring or whatever, again, whatever you call it is called, but uh, just kind of a, applying a little bit of lubrication there because it does rotate slightly. And next up, we have this spring here, and this spring has got a serious. I mean, the, the, this spring is this spring is really when it's in place. It, there is quite a bit of torque on it, so um, it uh, it took me a bit to kind of find the right way to do that. I mean, I have the video edited down to where you see me actually putting it in, but uh, I played with this for uh, you know probably five or ten minutes trying to figure out the best way to you know which side needs to go in first all that stuff because it's not necessarily obvious. I mean, I don't work on this style of, you know, th this, this style of uh, calendar works all that often, but um, I went ahead and, uh, you know, I'm holding that down with my little hold down tool and uh, I found it easier in the end to set the shorter side of the spring to, you know, to ap apply tension to the spring on that side of it. And then um, once that's done, I'm, I'm holding the spring down again and I'm just going to apply a little bit of lubrication where it interacts, where it, where, where it puts tension on that, uh, that's that, that advancing lever. But once that's done, we can install the, uh, the date wheel itself. And I'm just kind of making sure that, uh, that, that advancing, you know, arm spring thing is uh, in between two of the teeth and that that date wheel is set into the proper position. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it, just making really careful, being really careful that I get it in all the way. And then next up, we can put this cover plate on. And uh, that cover plate, again, you can see where it kind of covers up the teeth. 
um, on that wheel where it is. And that's what kind of holds that wheel down. But um, once we get this secured into place with these three screws, that will, uh, that will ensure that that uh, date wheel doesn't move. And um, it, again, I'm, I'm being very careful. I'm, I'm really concerned because I have that large spring underneath it. And so I'm like, um, especially with this first screw, I'm being super cautious and super careful just to make sure that I don't bump it or anything and dislodge and make the, you know, uh, you know get that spring out of position. But um, we get all three of these put in place here and uh, torque down. And then uh, that wheel is safely on and that spring is held safely underneath it. And then uh, we can move on with the rest of it. And here I'm just applying just the final torque just to make sure that I have everything, you know, tightened down properly all the way. And I just, I hit each of these screws one more time just to make sure that everything's good there. Once that's done, uh, now we can do the setting lever uh, for the, for the day wheel. This doesn't advance it. All it really does is make sure that it, 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 it stops that wheel in a very specific position. Um, and so uh, apply a little bit of, HP 1300 to the post. And then I'm applying just a very slight amount of 9010 to the, uh, to the edge of that, um, indexing arm. And so, uh, just, just a, you know, a, just a very, very, very tiny amount. And that'll eventually kind of work its way around that wheel, but, uh, we'll get that wheel kind of set in place there in between two teeth on that wheel. And then we can install the spring and this spring here, uh, I just kind of get it roughly set into place real quick. And then uh, I'll just add a, a, just a tiny bit of lubricant uh, on the side of that arm there. I got some on the top of it real quick, but I'll clean that up. But um, I'm using my little hold down tool. Again, uh, those things are invaluable uh, as much as a good set of tweezers and uh, a good set of screwdrivers is, uh, you know, a, an expensive one, like a Bergeon, you know, and everything they make, I mean, they make good stuff, but it's not cheap. But even then, I mean, that tool, a Bergeon one's $10. So a cheap one you can get for 2 or $3. But I mean, they are invaluable. So I'd highly recommend, um, if you're interested in getting into watch repair, um, make sure that's on your list, for sure. It will definitely come in handy. But um, after that spring's set in place and uh, we clean up that excess lubrication, we can just finish by installing this cover plate. And uh, just like that one above this cover plate, it, you can see it, it covers, it looks like two teeth on that wheel there just as, um, you know, it just to kind of keep it held down, but, uh, it's held on by one very small screw, but, uh, we'll get that tightened down. And then, uh, this thing is really starting to come together. So, uh, I put the hour wheel on just to kind of test cause that you have to have the hour wheel on in order to engage the calendar works, but, uh, I put that on there just to kind of test everything and make sure it was good to go. But now we have the fun job of assembling the automatic works and, um, uh, this is uh, yet another time. Again, I apologize. I forgot to put, hit record on the, uh, on the, uh, microscope, but, uh, you know, uh, eventually I remembered and, uh, later on there, I do get some microscope shots in there, but, uh, I'm, I'm assembling the parts in here right now that don't, you know, uh, everything but the springs. And, uh, then we'll kind of go through later and, uh, lubricate everything once it's in place, except for, you know, I've, I've already taken care of lubrication on that post on that part. I'm a, installing. But, um, we kind of get everything set in place. And what I learned is that these screws, although they look very similar, they are not the same. So, uh, this is a uh, second attempt here. I had the wrong, I had the wrong spring in at first for that, uh, that little, uh, that click there. But, uh, once I get that put in place, we can install this other spring and I'm trying to be very careful not to bump it or get anything out of place. But as you can see here, when I'm you know, I, I install this spring and try to get it set in place. It doesn't, when one side goes in, the other side pops out and then you just kind of have to play with it and, you know, have patience. But I get that spring set in place, uh, finally. And then, uh, I'm trying to, well, hang on here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. It took me longer than I remembered, but yeah, see there. I mean, when one part goes in, another one kind of pops out of place. And so I kind of had to go back and forth. And I thought about speeding this video up just, but I mean, I, I thought it, you know, it was kind of a disservice because if I sped it up, it would just look like it all went together, you know, very easily. But the, the truth of the matter is it didn't. And uh, th these are very fiddly. 
And um, so I'm just, uh, now that I got that, you know, that one spring in, I'm doing this next one here. I've got to get that wheel set in place. And then I have hold the spring down. And I'm trying to get that click engaged with that wheel and uh, just using very light pressure on that. But I, you know, I, once I finally kind of get it right there, you know, you take two steps back and you take a breathe heavily because the, now the next nerve racking part is putting this cover plate on. And now again, uh, I remember now, and now we have a microscope view, but uh, you get that cover plate on there. And thankfully I didn't knock anything out of position when doing that, but um, I could not get this screw in fast enough just to kind of hold this thing together. But I'm uh, also very nervous when I'm doing it. So you can see there, I'm holding my uh, screwdriver with a set of tweezers just to really steady my hand because I just don't want to bump this thing. But once we got that first screw in there, now it's not going to go anywhere at least. And so, you know, it's, everything's fine. But uh, once we get those two screws in now, I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the points on the springs where it interacts with those parts. Uh, I'm just using uh, a little bit of uh, 9010 here on these two. Uh, again, it doesn't take much, just a very, very, very small amount. But uh, lubricating those. And then uh, I'm just kind of double checking the action of this. So you can see when the wheel turns one one way, it's in gonna it's gonna engage with the rest of the automatic works. But when you turn it the other way, it kind of the, the wheel kind of moves out of place. And uh, it that way it's only gonna wind the watch when the wheel turns in one direction. But uh, we're lubricating the transmission wheel here. And then uh, on the other pivot, you know, we'll lubricate that other pivot when we install it. Uh, next up, we install this plate here that has the post that the uh, the rotor, the oscillating weight attaches to, and that's held on by three screws. So, um, we'll get these in. These screws were, man, these were small. Um, but, uh, anyways, we, we got all that in. I, I took out the footage of me fumbling with those, trying to get those screws started, but, uh, they have, um, a very blocky head on them and they don't want to, they don't want to sit up straight before they get tightened in. So they can be kind of a pain, but uh, eventually we get them all in there and tighten down. And then um, once that's done, then we can, uh, we need to remove power from the watch because you need to have the power removed in order to put those two intermediate wheels in. Otherwise it's going to put tension on them and they're never going to line up right. So here I'm holding the click spring out of the way and just letting the crown wind down in my hand. Earlier on, I know I cut the video short, but uh, the movement was so dirty, like it, it wouldn't unwind under its own power. I had to kind of manually unwind it. But uh, with a clean movement, as you see here, I mean, it. if you kind of release the tension in your hands, that, that thing unwinds great. And then I just kind of let it wind down and you can watch that balance. And, you know, it expends the last of its power and just comes to a stop on its own. And now we know we have uh, removed all power from the watch. So um, I'm only showing this one side being lubricated, but I lubricated both sides of that uh, intermediate wheel. And we'll get this set into place. And it just kind of slides right in there underneath the third wheel. And it's uh, engaged, the teeth engage with the crown wheel right there. And then the next one here, uh, I lubricated both sides of it, but um, showing that one. And then that one there kind of goes in the opposite direction and uh, engages with the teeth on that first intermediate wheel. And then the teeth on the top of that are going to engage with the wheel that's on the uh, automatic works itself. But that little mini train of wheels is what inter connects the automatic works with the, um, the base movement. But with that in place, um, I'm going to lubricate the bottom side of that transmission wheel. And then, uh, just so that that can, you know, we, we don't want to forget that. And then we can install the bridge. And, uh, this one here wasn't too bad, but the one thing you got to be careful on these is you want to make sure that all those teeth are interacting between all the gears before you start tightening any, anything down. So once you kind of get it, in place and I'm, I'm just kind of letting it find its home here. And then um, once you kind of get it set into place where it's in its final position, just like you see here, what I'll do is uh, you just kind of hold it down with that holder tool and then rotate the gears. And what you're looking at, you can see all the way from the ratchet wheel is turning all the way up to the, the gears inside the automatic works itself. And that tells you that everything's interacting like it should. And so once that's done, then we can just install the four screws holding this plate down. Uh, the first three we're going to install are the three shorter screws that we identified earlier. 
And then the four screw is going to be that one at the 12 o'clock position. You can see that the plate for the automatic works is uh, it's going through the upper and lower. So it's, a, it's that's why there's a longer post on that one screw. So we'll get that third one tightened down. And uh, here I'm, yeah, I'm just showing you kind of that longer screw there going through into that uh, last position. But uh, I'm getting these, I'm not torquing them down just yet, just getting them in there. And then uh, I'm just gonna give this one more test just to make sure that, you know, everything is working like it should. And then we can just uh, tighten those down fully uh, and just work our way around the plate. And uh, there we go, there's the last one. And uh, after that, we just, uh, I'm just putting a wind in the watch again. You can see the automatic works there kind of spinning, spinning along there when we wind the watch. But uh, there it is running and installed and uh, the movement kind of happily beating along. The next thing to do uh, on this is to install the dial and hands. So uh, I loosened the dial feet screws and then uh, we're gonna put the dial on there. Uh, again, uh, once that's on, I'm just uh, gonna go ahead and just tighten down those two dial feet screws kind of, and they're based, they're about, a they're 180 degrees apart from one another on this one. And then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and advance the time just uh, to where the uh, the rollover for the date is to indicate midnight. And then uh, we're gonna install, the start with the hand installs. Um, the, uh, just kind of trying to get this this hour hand kind of lined up with 12 as best I can here. And just, uh, I'm, I'm just barely to put a tiny amount of pressure on there just to kind of get that set in place. That way I can move that over to my hand setting tool and um, without it moving around on me. Uh, same thing here with the, the the minute hand, uh, kind of get that lined up at 12 as best I can. And then um, I'll take that over to the hand setting tool and uh, you can see it kind of, yeah, that's a pretty good view there of it, uh, of it setting that hand down into place. And then I check them just for spacing to make sure that they're, they're parallel with one another and that nothing's rubbing. And then I'm gonna advance this here and then check where the rollover happens. And right there at about four minutes to midnight, that, uh, that rollover happens, so that's that's wonderful. And then the next one to go is the last hand on the watch is the seconds hand. So uh, we carefully kind of get that set into place and then just just the tiniest, tiniest little tap here on the top just to kind of get it started. And um, you can see that thing kick along and then I'll take it over to the hand setting tool and then uh, just put the, I mean, it barely, barely moves in at all, but um, it doesn't take much. I mean, here, I thought this was a really cool shot of, uh, just kind of seeing where the, you know, you can really see them, you can see the minute hand moving in real time. And then I'll speed the video up here. And I, I just thought this was a cool shot. And then you can see when the second hand comes around right at midnight, uh, right. It's coming up right now. Um, you know, I, my OCD requires me to, I want to set those things as close to zero. But the funny thing is, you know, as soon as you manually set the time on the watch for the very first time, all that goes out the window. But, um, you know, uh, I think I think watchmaking or watch repair is kind of a good hobby for me, and I kind of have a very technical and OCD kind of personality, so uh, I kind of like stuff like that. So taking a look at the crystal, I went over it with PolyWatch at first, but it didn't take out any of the big stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do some sanding on this thing and really give this thing the full works here. So I'm gonna kind of let this video go. <laughs> That crystal turned out well, and uh, there was actually a lot of sanding in between each of those stages. Uh, I mean, I, I just showed a brief amount of it, but uh, 
here I'm uh, and again, sorry for the, I changed lenses on the camera and then uh, there was a tiny, tiny bit of dirt on there. So on the desktop camera footage, briefly, uh, you, you're going to see a few marks. There's no getting rid of that, unfortunately, but uh, I, uh, I, I caught it later on and then cleaned the lens on the camera. But uh, I installed a new crown gasket and then I'm holding the, the crystal in since it comes in from the backside of the case, holding it in with Rodico while I reassemble this, uh, recase this watch. And then uh, once we get the that in the first thing I'll do here is uh, we'll uh, reinstall the crown and uh, get that set into place. And then uh, I think I pulled it back out here. Uh, but yeah, so I uh, go into uh, set in the movement ring and uh, this movement ring is a super tight fit. So uh, I pull that crown out briefly and then uh, get my hold down tool and uh, kind of just adjust this thing a little bit here to kind of get this movement ring started. And this thing here is a super tight fit, which ultimately is a good thing. Uh, I mean, nothing's going to move around, but um, once I get that in and just to kind of applying pressure evenly all the way around, just to make sure it sits, sits down fully. The next thing I'm going to do is just apply some lubrication to the uh, oscillating weight post. But then uh, as soon as I did that, I realized that I uh, still hadn't, you know, reset the ground into place. So I went ahead and push that crown in real quick and then um, go ahead and uh, tighten down the setting lever screw just to uh, you know, permanently set that into place. But uh, once I get that crown set back in and uh, resecured, I can uh, finish up here by uh, installing the oscillating weight. And you gotta be real careful on these uh, because there's a, you know, if you look at that center post, so when I first press it down here, it's not fully down all the way and you don't wanna press down on, otherwise you could damage the gear. But when I start turning it, you can see where it kind of dropped down. And that's where it, you know, where the, the, the gear on the underside of that oscillating weight, uh, engaged with the gear and the automatic works. But once that's done, we, uh, this, uh, this hold down plate, so, you know, it's, it, it slides in between the, the, the rotor and then the gear on the underside of it. So, uh, I'm going to get this screw started and just not tighten down fully, but just, just started. And then, uh, then once it's started in, I'll push it in all the way, just like that. And then that, that, uh, that seated fully into place between the gear and the rotor itself. And then, uh, just do a final torque on that, um, on that gear. Next up is the case back gasket. So we're just going to apply a little bit of silicone grease here, just with my little Seiko applicator pad. Uh, the original grease on this thing is long since gone. I've, I mean, I've just applied just regular silicone grease to it, but, uh, it's a little off camera here, but I just set that O ring on the case back and then, uh, Go ahead and uh, get this thing screwed down. I did a little cleanup on this, uh, so that case back looks a lot better than what it did before. Um, I didn't go too crazy with it or anything, but uh, got a lot of the small scratches out and whatnot, but uh, it, uh, it turned out pretty well. So here I'm uh, putting it on the uh, on the tool here to uh, re-secure the, uh, the case back and uh, torque it down properly. I'm using plastic here just to avoid scratching anything. Uh, it makes for a difficult video, you know, to see, so you can see what's going on, but I'm pretty sure you get the idea. But um, we uh, torque this thing down properly. And then uh, the next thing we have is the bracelet. And so this bracelet, if you watch the Sea Lion video, um, this is the bracelet that originally came on the M55 Sea Lion. That was not original to the watch, but it was a kind of very cool, period correct, little spidal expandable bracelet that uh, I thought just looked great. And so I'm going to use it on this watch here. Uh, cause it did not come with a strap or a bracelet of any kind, but it was the right size. And, uh, I just, I mean, I, it, 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 I think it fits the watch real nice. So, uh, we'll get this in and, uh, get the new spring bar set into place. And then, uh, here we go. Take a look at this thing. I mean, I, I think this thing cleaned up really nice. I, uh, got a little, do a little fast forward action here, but, um, I really like the hands and it's got the regular lumen and it's got kind of got, it's not black lumen, but it's kind of got that black kind of paint or whatever on the hands. I just think it looks great. I'm a super fan of this watch here. So, uh, I, you know, just took a couple photos. This is me, uh, kind of in the driveway on my way to work. I think it looks really good. Um, I went skydiving and so just kind of, again, super difficult to keep your arms steady, but, um, great watch. Uh, it, you know, this thing has an adventure underneath its belt already. And lastly, if you watch this channel very much, the customary trip into space. So, you know, any watch we can't 
it's kind of becoming a tradition on this channel, but um, I, I enjoy doing it. Thank you to everybody for watching. I really do appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, if you want to like and subscribe, I really would appreciate it. And we will see you on the next one. Take care.